Well, gang, it's happened. I've got the fever. Book fever, and you're going to get it too, because we're going to talk about a do it yourself cloud ebook server, DRM free. Stick around and learn about it. Now you might be saying, Ryan, why do you have those archaic dead trees in your hand if this is about ebooks? Are you, are you a grandpa who can't get with the new age? Well, before very recently, I would have said yes, because I couldn't get into the ebook revolution. There were two major reasons for that. The first one should be obvious, DRM. Ugh. Now, when it comes to movies, music, even video games, I have capitulated. I'm in the cloud. I got the Netflix, I got the Google Music, I've got uh, Amazon Prime, and I'm not crazy about the idea that someone else hosts my media, but it's so convenient. However, when it comes to books, I just couldn't bring myself to allowing that. Uh, books are so foundational to human knowledge, and the idea of someone else controlling my books, someone else owning them, and me just sort of borrowing them, I just couldn't get comfortable with it. And human history has a lot of examples of bad things happening when books are controlled by someone else. So I've always been looking for a way to host my own books, to have my own personal copies. Now, of course, there are DRM free eBooks. That's a thing. And when I got my first tablet, I really started to build up a library and started reading a lot on that tablet. But then I'm kind of a book slut. I'll jump from one to the next without finishing it. And like some sort of alcoholic husband, I want to come home months or years later and find that nothing has changed. I want to pick right back up where I left off. And that wasn't realistic because I was jumping from devices faster than I was returning to my books. And so I went from an Android tablet to a Surface tablet. Now I got a new operating system. There's no way to port the application settings to remember how much I've read of my library. And even if I could, that is a pain. And I wanted a way to have DRM free, but have a centralized server that tracked my progress and took care of everything for me. And up until now, I couldn't find that. Now the Google files among you are probably screaming or typing furiously in the comments before they listen to this part. Hey, Google Play Books. You can upload DRM free versions of your own books to Google Play Books. They'll serve over HTTP. It's a beautiful solution. And yeah, it is. It's a beautiful solution. It's really nice. And I used that for a while as well, but it's Google. Again, someone else is in charge of my library and they could take them away or decide that I shouldn't have them or erase my history, whatever they want to do. It's Google. And Google does have a bit of a checkered history when it comes to just uh, destroying their products, especially their online products and especially the ones that don't make them money. And remember that the Google Play Store sells books. So you uploading free books to the service that wants to sell you those books, can you really depend on that? So if you trust Google, yeah, Google Play Books is an excellent solution. You can upload your own files. It's great. But if you trust Google, I've got some great investment opportunities for you. Contact me and uh, give me your money because I'm gonna make great returns for you if you're that kind of person. If you don't trust Google, then you're gonna be interested in learning about Ubiquity, which is a software that lets you host your own eBooks and serve them over HTTP. And if you put this service on the cloud, then you have a service that serves you eBooks from anywhere. And you might be thinking, well, big deal, I could serve my ebook files from anywhere. I don't need a special software for that. But the key ingredient and the one that I've looked for for so long is tracking your progress. So you can read from one device. You get on the bus in the morning. Well, not these days, but assuming we ever get back to normal, you get on the bus in the morning, you read on your phone, you close the book, you go into your office. Things get kind of slow because the economy has crashed. You pop it up in your browser. You read a little bit. You close your book, you go home, you pick up your tablet right before bed, you read a little bit, 
and it's this seamless experience over HTTP that you don't have to think about. You don't have to worry about getting a new device. You don't have to worry about installing anything on these devices. You just host it on a server and you connect to it over HTTP. So we're gonna look at the basic install of Ubiquity, which is really trivial and not the way I would recommend doing it. And we're gonna look at running it in a container, which is the way that I run it. And I think is a fantastic way to host your own library. The default Ubiquity install is really basic. It's actually all stored in its own uh, compressed file. And that installation is completely mobile. So there's no actual install. You do have to have Java 8 if you want to run it this way. And from there, you just unpack it and double click the jar file and you're good to go. It's very basic. Uh, you use the administration screen to set up your folders after that. And <clears throat> there are several administrative changes you can make. You can set up users, you can do things like that. The cool thing about it is that it is, uh, the, it's completely mobile. So if you wanna move the folder around after the fact, you can do that. You can move it to other devices. As long as you have the config folder, you have your reading progress and everything else captured. And that's nice, but I don't recommend using the desktop version because I don't think that's really the best way to use this. Although it will try to uh, connect itself to your network and you can use this with a port forward if you really want to. If you want to open up your desktop computer to the internet, you could do this remotely, but let's not do it that way. If you're going for a command line install, it's basically the same process. You just have to get Java and instead of double clicking the jar file, you just run it with the Java command. It all works basically the same way. Uh, you can pass some parameters to it. There are some options here, but once again, this is not how I run it and it's not how I recommend you run it. It's a perfectly viable way to do it, but it could be so much nicer with a container. So let's look at running this in Docker. If you do not use Docker and you haven't, uh, something that you've been wanting to learn, this is a great example to get started with because it's just a great scenario to use Docker in because you can put the Java requirement and the Ubiquity server in, and it's already done for you here. This, uh, I'm, I'm using this Linux server slash Ubiquity container. This isn't the only one, but this one works great. And it's gonna take care of everything for you. The Docker installation and setup is probably slightly more involved than the Java installation that you'll have to go through for the other one. So just bite the bullet and get into this if you haven't already. And once you have Docker installed, you simply have to pull down the Linux server here, the, this container, and you'll be ready to go with one command. And we'll look at that command now. We're gonna look at uh, some command line options here to make this work in a container but allow me to manage my library out of the container. We're gonna set the user so we don't get any sort of uh, permissions issues and some stuff like that. Let's look at the command. So step one is to pull the container down. And uh, if you see, I've already done that. I have the latest version. And then we wanna run this big long command here. And uh, to make this more readable, I'm gonna break this out uh, into each parameter in Notepad, and we can talk about what each thing does here in order to set up Ubiquity the way I run it. So the way I run my Ubiquity server, I run it locally, although I could uh, forward the port and make this accessible to the internet. Obviously, the ultimate way to run this is hosted in the cloud. That way you can get to it from anywhere. But the setup would be the same there. So let's just look at the parameters here. Uh, Network equals host. Now this is just going to pull the container network out and make it accessible with the host network. That's just a standard Docker command. This, the, the slut dash E is going to set the uh, user ID and the group ID. And the reason you want to do this with your Ubiquity is you don't want any kind of permission issues. So this is going to be whatever user you're going to use to manage your library of books you want to set to this so that the container isn't running as a different user as the user you're going to use to manage everything. The dash V lets you pull the folders that Ubiquity is going to read from out of the container to the host 
discs. So here I have a NTFS mount where I keep all my media. So I'm going to pull the configuration folder, the books folder, the comics folder, and the files folder. I'm going to pull all of these out into this external drive where I'm keeping all of my uh, media. I've got this set up as a SMB share. And so I can manage my books from anywhere on the network. And I don't have to worry about, you know, accessing that container file system to deal with this. Restart unless stopped is just a way to keep this thing from stopping. And it would suck if you were traveling somewhere and you had your, this running in the cloud. And for some reason the container stops and it doesn't restart itself. So that just causes it to restart itself unless you have explicitly stopped it. And then we define the container image that we want. And this will run and it will create your ubiquity, ubiquity in Docker. If you are new to Docker, one thing to keep in mind here is uh, this will run in the foreground. If that foreground session goes away, like it times out your SSH connection or something, this will stop. So you want to make sure that uh, you don't, you, you background this process or you stop it and restart it from the, uh, the Docker administration and not count on your foreground session staying there for the entire time. That's just some basic Docker stuff, but because you might be starting with this, just keep it in mind. By default, your administration account is, well, it's not really an account, it's just a password. You'll set your password after you install by visiting port 2203. You can change that port, and if you run as Docker, you can map that container port to whatever port you want on your host system. Uh, 2203 works fine for me. And once you have set your password, you have a number of administrative options here. You see you get some information about how many you've added and updated recently. You've got logs. I would definitely recommend you turn on the automatic scan. That way you don't have to come in here and tell it to look for new books every time you upload them. Like I say, I manage my books through SMB in the host operating system. So every time I add a new book, I don't want to have to go into Ubiquity. And you can set that for a, a period of time. And you can come in here at any time and launch a new scan. It defaults to disabled, so definitely turn that on. You can add folders and change some of the UI stuff here when it comes to comics or books. And uh, you've got the, you can add folders for raw files Security will allow you to set up user accounts. Uh, personally, I'm the only person reading on this. I don't use this. I assume, though I have not tested, that the reading progress tracking is per user. So if you want multiple people reading from the same library, you would definitely want to set this up because otherwise you're going to be overriding each other's progress. Uh, another way, if you didn't want to do it that way, run multiple containers and have everybody on a different port would also solve that problem. You've got some advanced options and uh, that's pretty much it for the administration. You don't really need to do a lot here, but it's pretty versatile. You can set up a, a number of things. The user accounts, again, I have not tested, but I have to assume that the progress tracking is per account, which is really nice. And finally, with everything set up, you are ready to start reading. You access Ubiquity by default on 2202. And if you haven't set up passwords or user accounts, it's gonna let you write in. Keep that in mind. If you expose this to the internet, you don't want people reading your books. Uh, even if you don't care if people enjoy your library, keep in mind that they will overwrite your reading progress. So you don't want that to happen. There's a comic section. I'm just gonna mention that in passing. Uh, I'm not a big comic reader, so I did, uh, carefully scan one comic book just to show this to you and uh, that works fairly well it can load somewhat slowly because these are large files you have uh, a series of options with your comic books how to split the double pages how to fit the page and it gives you the, the hotkeys over here one cool thing about comic books is it gives you an actual page count. You don't get that in regular books because of the way that it tracks progress, because it's easier. These are individual images rather than just collections of words. And uh, really not much more to that. You have the left and right switch pages. Again, a feature that is not available in the regular books because of the way 
progress and pagination takes place. But you can sort of control that. And again, loading times because you are loading large images over whatever connection. This could eat up a lot of bandwidth if you are reading remotely. So with comic books, just keep that in mind if you're doing a cloud hosting feature. You, when you're done, you can always close your book. And again, next time you go in, it will remember your progress, just like regular books. The book library is the star of the show here. That is why I am so excited about this thing because these are all DRM free EPUBs. They belong to me. No one can delete them. No one can stop me from hosting them. And my progress will be tracked. The whole thing is served over HTTP and it's just a great solution for a do-it-yourself EPUB or DRM free ebook server. Uh, as you can see, we'll, we'll check in on here on a book that I've already started. Uh, it's kind of cool because this, this is pulling from uh, the EPUB itself, but you get this nice little preview. You can always download the raw file, which is nice if you are planning on traveling, if you want to share it with somebody else or whatever. And then the read button will launch the actual reading application. You see how fast this is. It's running over a local network, but still there's a tiny amount of data being uh, transferred here. 0.2 megabytes for the entire book you saw there. Now, one thing about this, uh, one negative is the user interface. It is not great. Now you'll see that this actually landed in the middle of this thing. I'm at a high resolution here, but it will scroll. The, the scroll will jump to wherever you left off. And uh, it's, it's a lot better on a tablet or a phone, obviously, because you don't have all the text on the screen. The previous and next page are these icons down here. Not great. Now, in a lot of reading apps, you have you can just flick the page and you get the turning animation, or you can just tap the side of the page. That is not the case here. The screen is not divided into tap controls. Now, if you look back at the comic book section, you see that is the case there. Why not here? Well, it's because of the way they do pagination and the way they do tracking. It's just not realistic to have that because of the way it works. Uh, generally, if you have a table of contents in your book, then each of these items will be a an individual section. So here we go. Chapter two is one big HTML page in your book. We and then your previous and next page will take you to the next one, but it does track your scrolling. So if I close my book here and I reopen it, then I'm, it's going to take me to the ex exact same scroll. So it keeps your place, but it does only break it down. You have long chapters of reading. And if your book doesn't have chapters, then you're, you're stuck with just dealing with the scroll. So you want to definitely want to go with well-structured eBooks when you're using this thing. Other than that, uh, the UI, you can of course do a night mode. You can change the font and the margin and things like that. You do get hotkeys, not super useful in tablet mode, which is why you would want this in most cases, but it's there. And then you get the links to table contents and close the book. Close book is important because it will take you back to your library and you can, uh, launch another book. They don't all have descriptions. It depends on how well your uh, file is built. And boom, there we go. Chapter 20. That's where I stopped last time and I am ready to start reading again. Uh, night mode is definitely, here's a, a problem that I found. So for whatever reason, this EPUB, the text color doesn't adapt to night mode. Most of them do, but not this one. The ultimate way to do this, as I previously mentioned, is in the cloud. You want to put this in cloud hosting so that you can get to it wherever you are, anywhere that you go that has a web browser. And what, where did we not find a web browser these days? Uh, one thing to keep in mind, by default, your library does not have a password on it when you launch this thing. So make sure you put a password on it. You can do that in the account section. And, uh, the other thing to keep in mind is uh, from time to time, you want to make sure that there aren't any security updates for your container because uh, that will not automatically update. Now, a couple things that you could do to make this even more robust 
is that sometimes obviously we, are, we want to travel to remote locations and we might want to take our books with us there. So let's say that you're going camping or hiking or you're gonna unexpectedly spend some time on a cruise ship with no Wi-Fi, then you wanna take your library with you, but since this is being served from the cloud, how are you gonna to get to it? Well, because the config folder in Ubiquity is completely mobile, you can just move it wherever you want, this whole thing is self-contained in one directory, then as long as it's not running, you can sync that config folder and your library back and forth between two of the same Ubiquity versions. So you could set up an rsync, for example, to sync everything onto a tablet that's not connected to the internet, and you could take that with you and then just sync back when you return, and all of your progress will be recorded back to your cloud. So uh, that would be, you know, it's not the simplest thing in the world, but it is a solution for offline reading without losing track of everything. The other possible negative here is uh, dedicated e-readers and how they might handle Ubiquity. I, I think most e-readers these days have a web browser in them, and that should be all you need. But it's also true that uh, Android has specific apps for this. They seem more geared toward the comic books, the ones I've looked at. But your e-reader might have some sort of plugin or some kind of app that will interface directly with Ubiquity. So you might want to check that out. But really, even your refrigerator has a web browser these days, so it's unlikely you're going to find a device that doesn't have some way to access this. If you're excited to get started with this, but you don't have any DRM-free eBooks, head on over to Project Gutenberg. You can download old books for free, and some of them are pretty good. I would personally recommend you start with The Count of Monte Cristo, one of my favorites, and it's absolutely free. So you can get started on your own do-it-yourself cloud library with a great book and learn how it all works.